Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, our COVID-19 BI Claims and Australian Update. Uh, my name is Andrew Howden. I'm a partner in the BDO Brisbane office. Uh, today's webinar will be recorded and a copy will be available after today's session. Um, I acknowledge the Jagera and Turrbal people as the traditional custodians of the country uh, I am meeting on today. We recognise their continuing connection to the land, water and skies. We pay our respects to the elders past, present and future. Um, for they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of Indigenous Australia. Um, so today, um, I guess it's been well documented, the economic impacts on um, businesses as a, as a result of COVID-19. Um, as I said, it's been well documented. Um, one of the key ways to mitigate the financial costs of these interruptions is to determine whether or not businesses can recover losses um, under their insurance policies. However, whether or not insurance policies cover business interruption or, or BA, BI claims caused by COVID-19 uh, continues to be a topic of debate. So today uh, we're going to discuss the current Australian landscape uh, regarding COVID BI claims. Um, we're lucky enough to be joined by fellow insurance and BI experts, uh, Mr. Cameron, uh, Mr. Richard Cameron Williams of BDO uh, in Manchester, and Mr. Mark Darwin, a uh, partner at Herbert Smith Freehills. Um, Richard Cameron Williams, as I mentioned, is a partner in our BDO Manchester office. Um, I think it's around 11 o'clock uh, over there, uh, 11 p.m. over there at the moment. Um, uh, Richard is a partner in our forensic services division and specialises in reviewing and measuring complex financial losses of various scopes and sizes for legal professionals and insurers throughout the United Kingdom, Europe and the Middle East, Africa and the United States. Uh, Richard has acted as an independent accounting expert or lead on cases involving loss of profits, breach of contract, public procurement disputes, business valuations and fraud investigation. Uh, Richard has given evidence in the High Courts in both London and Manchester. Richard has extensive experience in handling complex business interruption claims worldwide uh, across a wide range of industry sectors. Uh, he's currently overseeing hundreds of COVID-19 BI claims throughout the United Kingdom. Um, we're also lucky enough to be joined today by Mark Darwin, a partner in the Herbert Smith Freehills Brisbane office and head of the Australian Insurance Focus Group. Mark has 30 years experience helping clients resolve a wide range of commercial disputes, including contract and insurance disputes, and has been part of crisis management teams following major incidents involving infrastructure failures, floods, fires, environmental contamination and public health issues. Mark helps clients negotiate outcomes that protect their liability exposure and helps corporate policyholders recover business interruption losses from their insurers. Mark's expertise is recognised by clients and peers in the Australian Financial Review's Best Lawyers, uh, Chambers Asia Pacific and Legal 500 Guides, which rank Mark as one of the leading policyholder insur insurance lawyers in Australia. Um, Mark also worked very closely with the Herbert Smith Freehills London insurance team who acted for the FCA on behalf of policyholders in the UK FCA test cases. So again, um, as I mentioned, we're very lucky to be joined by both Richard and Mark today. Um, finally, a little bit about myself. I'm a partner in the BDO uh, Brisbane Forensic Officer um, Forensic Services Division. Um, I've got over 20 years experience working in Australia, throughout Asia and the United Kingdom. Uh, before joining BDO, I had commercial roles where I was responsible for large scale projects um, throughout Australia, Canada, Asia and the Middle East. Um, I've also acted as an independent accounting expert on cases involving personal injury, loss of profits, business interruption claims fraud and financial investigations. Um, before we hear from Mark and Richard today, um, if there are any questions uh, from the audience, um, please just type them in the chat box uh, and we'll answer these at the end of the seminar. Um, however, please note we'll, we'll be unable to provide specific advice on policies, um, but obviously we can provide some high level insights and guidance. So today we want to cover a range of topics. Um, firstly, Mark will talk about um, what a successful claim will look like and what those elements are. Uh, Mark will run us through um, the first uh, Insurance Council of Australia test case. Um, so while it was a win for policyholders, um, what does that actually mean going forward? Um, he'll also touch on the Star Casino test case and the second test cases, which um, have just finished um, uh, going through the courts. Uh, we'll then hear from Richard around what has happened in the UK um, and then some of the key quantum issues that have arisen uh, when making a claim for COVID-19. Uh, and then finally, uh, we'll quickly touch on what can be done now to reserve your right uh, to make a claim. 
So with that, I might hand over to Mark uh, and he can run us through from a legal perspective, um, I guess the elements of a successful plan. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, thanks to BDO for having me uh, along this morning um, to talk to you about the COVID BI, which has been the subject of great uh, controversy in the media and the legal circles over the past uh, 18 months or so. Um, if we could just skip forward two slides, Andrew, pass the outline to the elements of successful claim. So the three things that it's important to understand the background to this just go back one, please. Yeah, so it's important to understand the background as to why this is controversial before we just go into what has happened in the test cases. So the elements to a successful business interruption claim are three. First of all, you need to have something that triggers the policy. Secondly, you need to check whether that trigger or the circumstances in which the triggers occurred is excluded. Uh, and thirdly, the trigger's got to cause the loss as opposed to um, the controversy is whether other other things would have caused the loss. So they're the three things you're looking for to see whether you've got a successful claim. And the reason COVID's quite controversial is that typically the ticket for business interruption cover is property damage. So you'll have physical damage to insured property and then under a typical ISR policy, which is what these um, which is what business interruption is typically covered under, you've got section one cover for property damage and you've got section two cover for the, the consequential loss or the business interruption that arises from the property damage. So typically you'll have a fire, section one covers the fire damage, section two covers the business interruption loss while you're rebuilding the factory after the fire has occurred. Now the issue is that COVID-19 is not physical damage. So um, you don't obviously have a claim. There were some talk early in the piece as to whether you could argue it was physical damage because if there was contamination, that might be, you know, that might damage the premises, make it less useful or something. But <clears throat> those sort of arguments ran out of steam anyway because at least in Australia, not many places had any COVID on them. Um, so <clears throat> no, no premises were really were damaged. Sometimes there is a, you know, a, a damage within 25 kilometre radius, so that might get you in, into the game. But the second problem was that COVID on your premises is only temporary, so once it's cleaned up, there's no damage that's caused by COVID-19, so it can't be an ongoing cause of the loss. It's actually the wider circumstances or the government shutdowns. And thirdly, there's a general exclusion in policies for damage occasioned by disease, and so if you're relying upon COVID being damage in the general sense, then the general exclusion for damage occasioned by disease is probably going to knock you out. So what you need to do is rely upon what, what is being called in these cases as non-damage extensions that which trigger your cover. So these are circumstances where notwithstanding the absence of physical damage, the, the policy will recognise that in certain circumstances, a business interruption claim can be lodged. And, and those fall into two or three categories. Um, firstly, there's the disease extensions. Um, I'll give you some examples of those on the next slide. Secondly, there's the civil authority extensions where the government authority um, takes action. And the third, uh, prevention of access. So up on the screen now is a few examples of the sort of clauses which are being dealt with by the courts. The top left one is the one that was dealt with, well, there was, there was 21, 21 clauses dealt with in the United Kingdom FCA test case. The United Kingdom quickly has a different regime to Australia. It's got a regulator called the Financial Conduct Authority, which has the authority to both prosecute insurers and to uh, bring test cases under some test case legislation. ASIC is the relevant body here, but they've really been too busy dealing with other corporate issues and they haven't they've really left, left this to the Insurance Council of Australia, which is basically the trade unions of insurers to decide what the test cases they're gonna run here. So it's been a lot less coordinated approach than what was taken in the UK. But in the UK, they had this clause that says that, that will trigger the business interruption cover where there's an interruption following an occurrence of an infectious disease at or within a 25 mile radius of the premises, the outbreak of which has to be notified to authorities. What was interesting about that case, that's to be contrasted with the Australian experience, is that 
the UK courts held that the occurrence of, an, of a disease within 25 mile radius of the premises was triggered if there was a single case of COVID within that radius. The Australian cases have got a, a clause more similar to the one down the bottom left of that slide, which talks about the outbreak of a disease within a radius of the premises. And one of the issues being determined in the second test case that is being run in Australia is what is required by an outbreak as opposed to an occurrence. And you know, what level of prevalence of COVID do you need in order to, for there to be an outbreak? Is it, is it more than one? If it's more than one, how many do you need before you cross the threshold? Um, another example, if you see on the top right hand side there, this is the case, the clause that's in a lot of um, the big brokers wordings, the Aon and uh, Marsh wordings have got a civil authorities extension. And it, it extends the word damage for the purposes of a section two business interruption claim to include loss resulting from or caused by any lawfully constituted authority in connection with or for the purposes of retarding a conflagration or other catastrophe. So that's the case that was uh, the, the clause that was used in the Star City Casino case. And there's a variety of other clauses on there by way of example. So what, what happened, what, what the second element is, you've got to have no exclusion. Now, contrary to what the insurance industry is telling everybody, there is not a general exclusion in insurance policies for pandemics. Um, I have some sympathy with them in the sense that, you know, the, the law of insurance is that the magic of averages applies so that the small few people that have claims are paid by the premiums paid by many. And when you've got a, a worldwide pandemic, then that is problematic for the insurance industry. But unlike you know, standard exclusions for things like war and nuclear um, explosions, et cetera, which are general exclusions, there is no general exclusion for pandemics. And what the controversy has been um, in the first test case is that while the English test case was going on and before it had been decided, the Australian insurance industry had an exclusion for um, to, to, to the disease extension for uh, diseases which were quarantinable under the Quarantine Act. That was the outdated legislation. And some of them referred to the current legislation, which is diseases under the Biosecurity Act. So you effectively had a disease extension of the nature on the left-hand side there that covered you for an outbreak of an infectious disease, but then there was an exclusion of certain types of diseases. And those that had a Biosecurity Act disease down the bottom there were considered to be um, excluded because COVID is an exclusion, sorry, is a disease listed under the Biosecurity Act. But the um, policyholders was, who had the outdated reference to the Quarantine Act in their policy were looking to make a claim. And apparently, even though that's five years out of date, that legislation, there were some 25,000 policies worth about $10 billion worth of claims according to the ICA's application for special leave to the High Court that still had that wording in it. And what they, they ran that case basically saying, look, when it says Quarantine Act and subsequent amendments, um, even though the Biosecurity Act is not an amendment to that act, it was, a, it was a new act that was enacted after the Quarantine Act was repealed that was what was really intended and therefore the court should treat the wording of the Quarantine Act as being effectively a reference to the Biosecurity Act. Now, the court held that that, just go back one, sorry. The court held that the first, in the first ICA test case that that was not the case and that it was not good enough um, to exclude claims um, for COVID because it was not a disease under the Quarantine Act. And despite what the insurers might have wanted it to say, it wasn't the court's role to update the incorrect reference. And so that means that people who've got that in their uh, policy do not have an exclusion as long as they've got a disease extension. The other one down the bottom there with the Biosecurity Act um, will, will definitely exclude claims reliant upon the disease extension. Um, but there's a question that the insurance industry is running in the second test case as to whether that exclusion exhibits a wider intention beyond simply a limitation on the disease, on a, 
a claim made under the disease clause to see whether it shows effectively a, a broader intention as to how um, diseases under the Biosecurity Act should be treated more generally, because the insurance industry says, look, th what this shows is that when we thought about diseases, we decided to exclude diseases under the Biosecurity Act. And so you, even though you might want to try to lodge a claim under another non-damage extension like prevention of access or civil authorities, um, and even though that's this Biosecurity Act exclusion is not a general exclusion, it's only a limitation on the disease extension, it should effectively be treated as a general exclusion across all aspects of the policy so that no claims related to diseases under the Biosecurity Act should be allowed. Um, this is the general exclusion for disease that I referred to earlier. And again, there's, there's an argument being run by the insurance industry that um, despite this being only an exclusion for claims arising from physical damage, that um, it ought to apply more broadly to have a general um, exclusion for disease. Um, if you're making a claim, for example, under the Civil Authority Act, even though that's not based on disease. That was thrown out in the UK case, um, but they're running it again in the Australian test case, the second test case. The next element, or the final element, sorry, of, of the claim is you've got to show that your loss is caused by the insured trigger. And if you just bear with me, just to explain why this becomes um, relevant, is that when you get your compensation for um, business interruption, you get the difference, you get your rate of gross profit, so your percentage profit margin plus your fixed costs on the difference between what's defined in the policy as a standard turnover less your actual turnover. And your standard turnover is defined as what you did in, in, in turnover in the same period in the previous 12 months, which is then adjusted by the trends clause or the adjustments clause. And the adjustments clause or the trends clause is written there. And what that does is it's typically to adjust last year's turnover for trends and other circumstances that would have affected, affected your results this year anyway, so that you get a proper compensation. So if the iron ore price was going to go up or go down, or if you got a new customer or you lost a customer or something happened in the world that would have made, made your results go better, or you were simply increasing your income 10% year on year, then you're not limited to last year's income. You, you get your, um, your turnover adjusted by the trends of the business. But what insurers uh, look at is to say, well, we have to look at what would have affected the business um, if the insured trigger did not occur. Now that's an easy thing to look at when you've dealt with a fire because you just say, well, if the fire didn't occur, what else happened in the world that might have affected the business's results anyway? Um, and if you take a, the, the bushfires at the beginning of last year, for example, a, a bushfire, a business that was affected by the bushfire would have had a regular claim but then when something like COVID comes along, COVID can be a circumstance that might have affected that business's profitability anyway. Or if you, um, you know, have a major customer goes bankrupt, as I say, that, that's something that might have affected your business anyway. But it's difficult when you've got a situation with multiple causes. So when you've got COVID and you've got things like um, the government action and the lockdown, what insurers are arguing in the UK test case unsuccessfully, but they're running it again in the Australian test case, is they say, well, look, yes, you might have a claim based upon the disease extension because there was a disease within 25 kilometres of your premises. But if we assume there was no disease within 25 kilometres of your premises, what would your results have been anyway? And they say, well, look, the wider pandemic and the government shutdowns would have meant that you wouldn't be doing much business anyway and therefore we don't have to pay um, well we compare that with what you actually did and there's not much difference so you're not worth anything and likewise when you lodge a claim under the closure by authorities extension you say well i was ordered to be closed by the government they say all right well if you were open so you weren't affected by that what would your results have been anyway 
well, everyone else was locked down and no one was allowed to leave their home, so your business wouldn't have been doing any trade anyway, so we don't have to pay much on your claim. Now, that was based upon a, a, a 10-year-old English decision called the Orange Express Hotels case, and that basically said the test is an undamaged hotel in, an, in a hurricane-damaged city, and the hotel wouldn't have been doing much business anyway because no one was visiting the hurricane-ravaged um, New Orleans it was in that case. But that decision was overruled by the UK Supreme Court in the test case that was held over there. Uh, and they basically held that it's not the purposes of the trends clause to throw out a claim which is otherwise a valid claim. And if there are concurrent causes that inevitably arise from the same underlying cause, then they cannot be used as a circumstance or a trend to exclude the claim. So effectively, COVID and the government response to COVID are to be excluded from the hypothetical scenario called the counterfactual. And so you assume no COVID and no government action and then work out effectively what your results would normally have been. So concurrent causes are excluded. If there was an exclusion, excluded cause, then that could be relevant. And that's why that Biosecurity Act exclusion on the disease extension is being run, run in the second test case as basically a broader exclusion on all coverage and not just a limitation on the claims under the disease exclusion. So that case isn't binding in Australia, um, but um, it'll probably be, well, I suspect it'll be very persuasive given that the two judges who decided the original Orient Express Hotels case are in fact now Supreme Court judges, which is the highest court in the UK. And they overruled themselves on their 10 year old decision and said that they were wrong 10 years ago when they decided OEH. So one would think that that reasoning is going to be upheld in Australia. Can I just quickly talk about the Star City case? This is on appeal. This was the first, first significant loss that policyholders have had in this whole debate. Um, the, the clause is, is on, on the top there. The first issue was whether loss resulting from needed to be physical loss. The insurers argued that because the whole context of the policy is generally dealing with physical loss, um, that it had to be physical loss caused by the authority. The policyholder said, well, what's the point of the extension? Because if I had physical loss, I would have been covered under my normal clause. I, I'm surprised they lost that point, but they did. Um, the court held that, well, one, one judge held, this is on appeal, um, that there must be a physical loss. Um, the second argument was uh, whether it was an other catastrophe. So you'll see the context is that, it, it, that the action by the government has to be for the purposes of retarding a conflagration or other catastrophe. Now, a conflagration is a fire. Uh, the insurers argued that um, conflagration or other catastrophe meant that the words other catastrophe had to be interpreted in, in the context of a fire and therefore meaning a physical event or a natural disaster that would have been covered by the policy if it hadn't been retarded by the government. And the uh, judge hearing that case agreed with the insurers that it needed to be a catastrophe in context of a physical nature that would have been covered under the policy if it hadn't been retarded by the government. Although the judge held that if he was wrong in that decision, that there was no doubt that COVID was a catastrophe and that the government action, in the ordinary sense of the word, and that the government um, action was to retard it. The insurers had argued that there was no catastrophe in Australia because the government had prevented the catastrophe by its lockdowns and that less people died of the flu than of COVID. Sorry, less people died of COVID than the flu annually. And therefore there was no catastrophe because it had been prevented and you can't retard a catastrophe that never happened in the first place. So this crazy, crazy argument, but um, the judge threw that out, but, but didn't um, find in favor of the insurers because of the way he held the wording. I think that's, a, that's an interesting uh, take on things. It's completely to the contrary of the first ICA test case where five judges of the New South Wales court held effectively, look at what the words that were used rather than what the vibe of the policy would be and what was really intended. I really have no difficulty with looking at the intention, but there's a real contrast between the approach that this judge took in the federal court 
and the approach that the New South Wales Supreme Court um, took in the first test case. So this this aspect is going on appeal, and I, we expect that'll be heard and determined before Christmas. So in the second, what happened is after they lost the first test case and they they weren't able to knock out a bunch of claims, and there was still this argument about how broad is the um, Biosecurity Act exclusion, the Insurance Council of Australia got together. Um, a second test case. It in fact involves nine actual cases involving small businesses. It's being run by the industry um, with the, they, they've picked the selected cases based upon what they consider to be a representative sample of complaints that have been made to the um, um, Australian Financial Conduct Authority and they are dealing with uh, issues like this. Uh, has there been a restriction on the business? So what are the words prevention, hindrance, closure and evacuation mean? So for example, if a restaurant that used to serve only seated patrons um, can't open but is able to serve takeaway, um, does that mean it's been prevented from operating? Now in the UK, they would say that if you, your substantial business in its normal form was prevented, then that is good enough to trigger the, that prevention of access clause. But we'll see what the Australian court says about all of that. If you rely upon the disease extension, as I mentioned earlier, there's going to be a debate around whether, um, you know, what, what prevalence do you need for there to be an outbreak as opposed to an occurrence? And um, the reliance on government action is also a big point by the insurers. So what they say is, when they gave coverage for the civil authority taking action that affects you to prevent um, a, a conflagration or other catastrophe or, or a disease, um, the insurance industry argues that it needs to be action specific to your vicinity or the insured's vicinity um, and not the broader specific, sorry, the broader um, blanket rules that the government brought in. So they'd say, well, we'd accept that you're covered if the government tells you you've got to close, but we don't accept the clause has been triggered if the government orders all businesses that are non-essential to shut down. So that'll be an issue that's determined in the second ICA test case. Um, there'll be an argument about that Biosecurity Act and how broad it applies. There's an argument for Victorian policyholders where there's some particular legislation there that deems amended acts as being replacement legislation. So that will affect Victorian policyholders who, who the insurers say, um, notwithstanding the first ICR test case, are still knocked out. They're revisiting that trends and other circumstances clause, um, and they're looking at um, issues around well, when does the indemnity period end? Because you know, if the lockdown ends, but the pandemic's continuing, you know, does the does the indemnity period end or can you continue to make claims until your business returns to normal? And they're also looking at some ancillary issues like um, whether benefits that you get under things like JobKeeper um, are savings and do they need to be deducted from your claim or, or, or is that effectively a windfall to the um, policyholders? Uh, I'm not going to read through all of these, but these are the nine cases. These will be in the slides that will be circulated, so you can see that if you're maybe analogous to some of these. The, these are the, the cases that have been picked as being the um, the circumstances that are being going to be determined. So not every dollar and every loss is going to be determined, but the, the second test case is going to determine in those cases what the principles that are relevant to um, you know those those type of businesses and whether they can they can make a claim and um, hopefully that will cover the field. It won't cover you know every circumstance. There never will be there'll be some more fights on, but um, we'll have to see what happens with all of that. Um, and that decision was sorry that that case was heard uh, last last week and the week before. Justice Jaggett has to make her decision. Uh, next month because the federal court, that is three judges of the federal court, uh, the appeal court has been scheduled for November to hear the appeal, which they know is inevitable. So an unusual circumstance, the appeal has been set down before the judgment's even been delivered. But they know that it's there's so much money involved in this that it's being heard as an appeal. 
with a view to a decision being delivered on the appeal before Christmas. My prediction is that whoever loses that appeal will apply for special leave to the to appeal to Australia's High Court, which is their last avenue of appeal. And um, so I, I predict that it will probably be still this time next year before we get a High Court judgment on that, that gives us some final certainty on this. So my tip would be um, get your claim in now so that when, if and when hopefully the policyholders win on this and there's a rush of people to their insurance claims, you won't be at the back of the queue. You, you want to be at the front of the queue when that happens. That's all from me. I'll hand over to back to you, Andrew. Thanks, Mike. I've got some questions here which I'll, I'll uh, put to you at the end of the um, at the end of the session. But um, Richard, over to you next. Obviously, the UK um, are probably a little bit more advanced than Australia um, with regards to their test cases. And um, as I mentioned in your intro, you're currently kind of busily working on a number of COVID um, claims throughout the UK. So. I guess I was just wondering if you might be able to share um, your experience so far with what's happened in the UK um, and then probably more importantly some of those kind of key quantum issues that, that have come out because I assume you know once the the legal side of it's finished with, with the various test cases um, that's then when we'll start to see some of these kind of um, quantum issues start to bubble to the surface. Yeah thanks Andrew yeah absolutely and um the UK test case has obviously been you know, incredibly helpful in addressing a number of issues, uh, but by its very nature, it was looking at um, the policies, the sort of specific, well, the, the wordings of the policies rather than the specifics of the losses, and then obviously trying to um, put into practice uh, the outcome from the test case has, has given rise to sort of further issues that are, are probably going to have to re require sort of further, uh, further litigation. So. I mean, the, the UK FCA did did pick up on this very quickly. Um, you know, should be applauded for that, and and started uh, the, the test case in the summer of 2020. There was uh, an original High Court verdict. I think it was around uh, September 20, which uh, was immediately appealed, um, and then the Supreme Court uh, judgment came out in uh, January of of this year. Um, and it was interesting because even after the original High Court and trying to um, take the, the outcome of, of the High Court verdict and, and try to apply that to policies, there was immediately you know, so many challenges, uh, especially from a sort of quantum perspective that were sort of having a significant issue, some of which were then um, specifically addressed in the Supreme Court appeal. And you know, there was quite a, a departure uh, from the High Court, the Supreme Court, and you know, as, as Mark has already covered, the overruling of the Orient Express case was was you know a, a very significant uh, win for for policyholders, and effectively it did uh, rob insurers of many of the the potential arguments they were looking to run on causation, um, because yes, you know, if there was sort of closure of a particular premises, there was still the argument that the wider pandemic would have been you know, impacting on the business and, and therefore, you know, very little money should really sort of get paid out. We were also seeing um, prior to say the March 2020 uh, lockdowns, well, a week before the lockdown, uh, Boris Johnson, the prime minister had already said there was going to be a lockdown. So in the week prior to the business closing, uh, the trends of the business you know, had fallen off quite considerably and uh, insurers were looking to rely upon those pre-trigger trends because the trigger only triggers once, once, once the premises is, is, is closed uh, to say, okay, well, that was the trend uh, prior, so we don't have to apply that. And to some extent, that could be say 20% of, of normal business. But the Supreme Court took all of those um, issues really away. It, it, it looked at, uh, and, and basically held that, that each occurrence of disease was a concurrent cause of all the impact of the pan pandemic, the, the majority of which was really um, you know, the impact of, of the UK government measures. Um, but this meant that um, all of the measures could then be sort of taken out so long as the, the policy had been triggered in the but for position was really just to put it back into a, a, a no COVID uh, position. Um, and really we've probably been sort of basing most of the analysis on sort of historic trends or budgets. 
because you know there's not even any comparative data to use because you know the whole world has really been impacted by COVID. Um, but a few of the sort of further issues that have uh, arisen, you know, one of the key ones is in relation to you know what's referred to as aggregation um, or the number of occurrences. Now, certainly in the UK, you know, the the extensions we're looking at. Um, you know, they're not the core aspects of the policy. It's, it's unlikely to sort of have, you know, the full level of sums insured, the full level of, of maximum indemnity period uh, available. For many of the SME type businesses, this might have been limited to only a three month indemnity period. Um, a number of the hybrid policies had only a hundred thousand pounds limit. Um, and then even some of the sort of, uh, sort of larger corporate policies still had uh, sublimits. Um, that in many respects were, were, were quite easily exceeded uh, given you know, the, the quite significant impact that we had in the UK. We had three you know, major lockdowns for you know, a number of months. Um, and obviously, you know, it was those, those uh, it was the UK government action uh, that was causing it. And so when you sort of take that into the sort of occurrences and the idea that each occurrence of the disease uh, caused the loss, it, it, it would seem strange that it's the same occurrence that caused the government to lock down in March 2020 as caused the lockdown in, say, November 2020. So many policyholders are seeking to effectively argue that uh, they have multiple claims that are triggered multiple times over the course of the pandemic. Um, and obviously this has the obvious benefit of giving multiple um, sublimits or if there's shorter indemnity periods, multiple periods of those shorter indemnity periods. And that's being heavily challenged um, by insurers, unsurprisingly, um, because this will have you know, a, a huge, huge uh, financial impact on the potential value of the claims. And, you know, one which is uh, currently being litigated, so uh, is sort of of public knowledge, is uh, called um, it's a company called Stonegate Pubs. They have, I think, about a thousand pubs in the UK. Um, but they filed a claim uh, for over nine hundred million pounds. Uh, their policy has a disease limit of two and a half million pounds. But of course, they want to be able to claim that limit potentially multiple times for multiple occurrences uh, and multiple lockdowns, and not only that, but also multiple locations, because under the same argument, it might not be the same uh, occurrence of disease that, that shuts uh, premises down in London as it does uh, that shuts premises down uh, in, say, Manchester. So, you know, those issues um, are very much live and what it's meant is that the initial quantum analysis has really just looked at, does it breach a single sublimit? And for many policies, well, quite clearly it does. So limited work has been done to quantify the actual loss that's been suffered. It's just over a certain sublimit. As soon as there's an availability of multiple sublimits uh, or multiple claims, you know, many of these claims will have to be reopened and, and, and reassessed, um, and, and the potential value of them could could increase quite quite significantly. So, you know, it's expected. Uh, I think it, you know, there's there's a few going through the courts at the moment, but when when exactly we'll get, um, you know, a, a judgment on that will wait to be seen. Uh, we understand that, that there's a certain sort of friendly litigation also taking place. Um, so, you know, insurers are sort of taking certain cases and running, you know, especially alongside some of the larger brokers um, to really just sort of try and get a handle on, you know, how, where this should go. So, you know, that really is, especially for some of the sort of larger corporates, um, you know, a, a significant piece that will rumble on for a little bit longer. Uh, just get the next slide. Uh, so, and the government assistance piece, uh, I think Mark mentioned uh, JobKeeper. Um, in the UK, there was, a, there was a, a couple of really key ones. I mean, some of the small businesses received uh, some just just uh, lump sum figures. 
uh, but the uh, insurance um, insurers uh, came out quite early to say that they wouldn't be looking to deduct those elements uh, from business interruption claims. But um, rates relief was also given for, for a number of businesses, uh, which is likely to give rise to a, a sort of saving under, un, under the policies. But you know, probably the biggest one by far, um, we had what was called a furlough scheme. So uh, businesses that had closed could put staff on furlough, they weren't allowed to work, um, and the government would pay up to 80% of their salary, and often you know, the extra 20% would be topped up by the business, but sometimes not. Um, and this you know, has given rise to you know, quite a few sort of challenges. I think there's an overriding uh, argument being run to simply that you know, it wouldn't be fair for insurers to benefit uh from uh, you know government funds to reduce the the losses that they have to pay out based on a policy but equally you know, insurers would say uh well you know you've had the benefit of that money and you might be over indemnified you know if, if we don't then deduct it from the claim uh, we have also been running a more, sort of more technical argument to this and, and it's probably relating to exactly how furlough gets treated from an accounting perspective you know ultimately uh, business interruption policy has a has a mechanism for the calculation, and, and that usually looks at uh, you know, loss of turnover, expected less actual turnover, uh, increased costs of working get added on, and then you deduct savings. Now savings are usually described as costs that are paid out, you know, savings in costs that are paid out of gross profit. Now in relation to uh, furlough, um, the wage costs still sit within the accounts; they're not reduced. Uh, in any way, uh, and it would be inappropriate just to offset the, the furlough monies um, from that cost. Um, accounting standards, certainly in the UK, basically say that you should uh, account for this um, by uh, including it as, as other income in the account. Now, that has the potential to then be deducted as part of the, the actual turnover of the business, but um, majority of the business interruption policies that, that, that I've seen in the UK, uh, you know, generally have seen um, worldwide, you know, have a specific definition of turnover income, which looks at the um, turnover income from uh, goods sold or services rendered. So it's very much looking at the, the trading income of the business. And the other income really sort of sits outside of the expected less actual, the loss of turnover uh, piece. So it may well sit that, that the, the furlough, um, while it does get received by the business, may just fall outside of the business interruption mechanism. But you know that's hugely contentious. Um, the furlough costs were, were significant, and you know it will have a, a very large impact uh, on claims whether or not that um, does get deducted. So unsurprisingly, that will also likely be um, subject to, to further litigation. Um, just a few other sort of bits and pieces that, that you know are still ongoing, and I think Mark has sort of mentioned a few of them. Um, you know, the impact of of COVID outside outside the UK. The the FCA test case was was sort of really sort of looking at COVID within the UK borders, and to some extent, um, a UK policy is looking at UK COVID. So you know, to what extent is our losses influenced more by by COVID outside of the UK? And you know, does that still get counted as a, a sort of concurrent occurrence that can still be brought back into the policy? And I think that's still a little bit unclear. Um, another point I think Mark mentioned earlier, the prevention of access. You know, does it stop when it's reopened? Um, you know, from a, a, a normal business interruption claim, you sort of have, you know, a, a but for position. Um, in, in my view, once the business is reopened, they've been closed for three months versus open for three months, which is the, the but for scenario. Even if there's a pandemic going on afterwards, the losses will still to be, will, will continue to accrue from the fact it had been closed for three months. So there might well be to a tail to the loss. So uh, not, not all of the losses being suffered going forward might be attributable to the closure period, but there might be you know, a further period where the closure is still influencing the, the the turnover of the business and that might still be something that could be claimed. Um, I don't know whether you have this in Australia, but we also have some premises which are disease at the, at the premises. 
and uh, these didn't fall under the original test case. Um, but in principle, the reasoning behind the Supreme Court judgment was simply that there needs to be an occurrence of the disease, which is then concurrent and therefore the policy triggers. So whether it was a nationwide requirement, 25 miles or one mile, it didn't, it didn't really matter so long as there was um, you know, disease within that radius. Disease at the premises, it's argued, is just an even smaller radius than one mile. It has to be at the premises. But once it's there, it's also a concurrent cause of all the government action. So you know, there's still an expectation that that will be sort of challenged further. And you know, the, the test case did look at 21 different policy wordings, and then there's a myriad of other policy wordings that are similar but not quite the same. And you know the specifics of hindrance prevention, uh, all the other aspects of of, of these wordings um, can can have quite a significant impact on how they're being treated. Um, and uh, you know thus far it has has been challenging um, to, uh, to to ensure and do the calculations and uh, get them all passed insurers. And I'm sure we'll need to um, get some further clarity on a number of these points before we can start finalising claims. Excellent. Um, uh, thanks, Richard. Some, some good insights there. So I guess um, probably before we move on to some questions, just lastly, I guess, what can be done now? Obviously, um, uh, Mark ran through from a legal perspective, I guess, the various elements um, of the policy. And then obviously, Richard touched on some of those quantum issues. But I think um, probably the key takeaways today um, would be really now, I guess, is the time to pick up your insurance policy and, and, and review it and consider it. Um, so look for things like the non-damage extensions, uh, prevention to access, um, civil authority, the disease clauses, those sorts of things. Um, look at whether or not there's any trend clauses. Um, and then as Richard kind of touched on previously, um, have a bit of a think about um, some of those indemnity periods um, and extension sublimits. But Probably the key thing once all that's been looked at is, is seek some legal advice. Um, I think Mark summed it up um, nicely at the beginning of the seminar is, is now is really the time to act. We, we don't want to kind of sit on this too late because um, you know if, if some of these test cases get through, um, you don't want to be at the back of the line with any potential um, claims. Um, and then otherwise too, I think now is probably a good time to start maintaining um, the documentation, supporting any potential claims. Um, and then also considering some cost savings. Um, I think a bit like the, the English um, or, or the UK test cases, it'll be interesting to see how COVID-19, uh, the, the JobKeeper payments are kind of treated um, here in Australia um, under any um, potential claims. Um, and obviously we just want to make sure that any loss, um, again, is attributable to COVID-19 rather than the other economic um, or, or market factors. Um, but I do have a couple of questions here um, before we finalise um, today. Um, Mark, uh, probably for you first, if that's okay. Um, what's your thoughts on where perhaps uh, we've got two policies? So I might have had a policy that's rolled over in say the last six months, um, 10 months. Um, my old policy might have been under the old Biosecurity Act, um, and then my new policy is under the Quarantine Act. Um, does my previous policy still potentially trigger a claim, or because I rolled over to a new policy, is that period now gone, or how should we kind of deal with that? Yeah, well, it's a good point, because what has happened is that as policies have come to be renewed after the beginning of the pandemic, there's now a blanket exclusion for of diseases of communicable of any kind under any legislation and it's a general exclusion including where it's concurrent cause of a loss so they've really done a a number on making sure that there's not going to be any current claim so if you pick up your policy don't look at your current policy because it'll almost i almost guarantee you it will exclude um communicable disease type claims what you want to do is look at the policy that was in place in February, March, April, whenever you're renewed um, at the start of the pandemic. And and you once once your claim is triggered, um, then your claim is lodged under that policy and continues, notwithstanding the expiration of that policy, 
provided the results of the business continue to be affected by the insured trigger. So, you know, if in if you've got a policy that you renewed on the 30th of June in 2020, but you're triggered, you're, you're triggered by a lockdown that started in March and the lockdown goes till you know August, you can at least have a claim up until August, notwithstanding that your policy expired. Excellent, good point. So really kind of go back to those prior policies and, and pull them out and have a good look at them. Yeah. Um, probably a second question again, um, I think directed at you, Mark, but Richard, keen on your thoughts on this too, particularly with what's happened in, in the UK. But um, do we feel like the um, Australian insurance companies have sufficiently provisioned for BI claims? Well, I don't know. There's been some big announcements um, in the press of some of them. Um, you know, originally they took the view that they weren't going to be covering them. And then after the UK case went against them, I mean, IOG most famously put like a $1.4 billion write down. Yep. Um, I, I mean, I have no idea whether they've provisioned sufficiently or not, but typically insurers take a pretty optimistic view that they're not going to have to cover claims. So they might well have not provisioned mm. for it. And Richard, from a UK perspective, has there been any commentary from, from insurers over there? Yeah, it's in bits and pieces. It's still quite difficult to know, um, you know, whether they are putting in the provisions for the multiple multiple claims aspect. And, you know, the the example of sort of gave for the for the Stonegate pubs gives gives a sense of the magnitude of that. And I think if if uh, yeah and yeah, to sort of put some context to this, you know, we're sort of seeing, uh, you know, arguments where every time the government um, changes what it's been doing to, to, to sort of treat the pandemic, whether it's a lockdown, whether it's a sort of, you know, tiering or this, that and the other, well, that's a new uh, claim because it's a, it's, it's a new government action triggered at a new point in time. We've seen those chopped up into... 20 separate periods and then chopped up into periods for England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland. So, you know, really when you start to sort of break down the pandemic, there is the potential for a huge number of claims. And then I think if you then apply that to some of the larger sort of corporate businesses, the, the potential losses are huge, absolutely huge. Whether or not they'll be successful with that, okay, that's a whole different question. Um, but but you wonder whether uh, you know they're really provisioning for losing the point on on the multiple claims. But sure, but it should surely the UK insurers have like the Australian insurers just every time any policy came up for renewal, just put a blanket communicable diseases exclusion. So in Australia at least, you you wouldn't be able to continue to trigger new claims now because your new any new claim is only can bound the end of the new policy. You can't use your old policy once it's expired if there's a new event. Yeah, I think a very, very, very small number slipped through the net uh, and got some coverage upon renewal. But yeah, absolutely. But you know, equally, um, you know, depending on when your policy renewal date is, you know, there's there's, there's businesses uh, that might have renewed in, in sort of December, January, February prior to the original one. Right. I think, continue to claim you know all the way through those policy periods but you know that period of 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 chopping up the impact and, and it, it just goes to show how much the UK government continued to intervene in different ways throughout 2020 just looking at you know putting aside 2021 um, you know we went through two major lockdowns tiering systems individual localized lockdowns just a huge number of changes in how the government um, reacted to the pandemic. So if it is correct that each time the government changes how it's reacting to the pandemic, and therefore that's reacting to a different occurrence of the disease, you start chopping up 2020 into a very large number uh, of periods, and therefore mm. you've got a large number of sublimits to start you know, uh, claiming. If you can then add locations on top or, or as an alternative, um, again, the, 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 the sublimit starts stacking 
you know, very, very rapidly to, to give rise to some quite substantial um, covered losses. Mm -hmm. It's certainly quite a, a complex area. And then I think finally, um, Mark, I think you, you touched on this before, but, but your gut feel on, on when Australia might finally make a decision after all the, the test cases and appeals are heard, when do you think we might get some, some visibility um, and, and a bit of a way forward? Well, I think we'll have a pretty fair idea before Christmas, and then there'll still be the prospect of <clears throat> an application for special leave to go to the High Court. So the High Court process in Australia is a two-step process. First of all, you need to get leave. So two or three judges will hear whether they think it's meritorious enough and of national enough significance and importantly enough for the High Court to hear it. You would think that they'd probably cross that threshold here. So that'll be you know, let's say a decision was made in, um, in before Christmas, you'd expect that would be heard in the first six months of next year. And then if they get leave to appeal, that'll be you know, another six months. So it could be Christmas next year before the High Court's finally ruled on this. And, mm. and, and as has happened in the UK, there'll be a whole series of how do we deal with the indemnity period and whether they start and stop type arguments that will probably still have to follow this because those sort of issues are not entirely being dealt with in this case. The quantification is being left. It's really just the theoretical, is it being, has it been triggered? You know, and what evidence do you need? You know, one of the issues in the second test case is that insurers are refusing to accept that the health data published by the authorities can be relied upon by policyholders as evidence of COVID cases. Um, they're suggesting that the policyholders need to show actual evidence of a case within 25 kilometres of their premises. And, uh, you know, it's just ridiculous, really. I mean, one of the businesses in the test case is a restaurant that's opposite the Royal Brisbane Hospital. And the insurers are refusing to accept that there was a COVID case within 25 kilometres of it because they need to prove effectively they should go and hang out outside the emergency ward and corner someone walking in to prove that they had COVID. I mean, it's just crazy. So hopefully, consistent with the UK Supreme Court where the insurers were um, hosed out on that and the court held that you're entitled to rely upon the health data, that, that, mm -hmm. that a similar decision will be made here. But insurers are really fighting this because of their philosophical objection that I referred to at the start of it, that they take the view that they didn't underwrite for pandemics. As Richard says, most of the time, they didn't give broad coverage for pandemics. They just gave, you know, a million dollars coverage here and $2 million coverage here for short periods under these sublimits for these non-damage extensions. Um, but we've certainly got a few cases where there were not sublimits on some pretty big policies. Um, and it's, I think it's those that the insurers are particularly worried about. Mm, mm. Just goes to show the importance, I think, um, you were talking about before about trying to prove that the case had happened near your, um, near your business or premises. I mean, you only go pick up the, the paper every other day and there's a whole list of exposure sites. So um, it would seem odd that you wouldn't be able to rely on that um, if it was near your business. Um, but yeah, interesting to see. But, Look, that's all the questions. So thank you for everyone um, that, that attended. Our, our details are on the screen. So if you do have any further questions, feel free to reach out to myself, uh, Mark or Richard. But um, thank you for your time today. And, and again, thank you, Richard and Mark, for joining and giving us insights into your um, uh, expertise and experience so far on these claims. But I think, um, um, Mark, I think before we leave, fair to sum it up, um, wait and see. And, and there's probably a lot more arguments before we get some final um, clear pathway forward for this? Yeah, well, my I would encourage people to have a look at their policy and just to put together the basics of a claim as a minimum, um, just so that they're not at the back of the queue when there's a stampede to the door of the claims officer, if these decisions go consistently with the way the English decisions and the, um, the Irish court South African courts. I mean, there's been a few of them. Um, not all of them will get up. There'll be some failures. This is not easy stuff and not every, you know, the devil will be in the detail when it comes to assessing the claims. But if you wait, you know, two and a half years, three years before you pull your details of your losses together, memories will fade and details will get lost. And it's just a, 
It's yeah. a question of are, are you going to just do nothing or are you going to do at least something to pull together the, your financials and you have your basics of you, how you're interrupted and what have you? Definitely, um, from an accounting perspective, the longer you leave it, um, the harder that evidence is to, to pull together. But um, look, again, thank you. I'm mindful of time. So um, thanks again for everyone. And again, any questions, feel free to reach out to us anytime. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.